Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now today we're putting together a budget PC build. This is less about the individual parts themselves but more about how you can source cheap hardware and a discussion about some of the quirks and issues you may run into when using used parts which are a must in order to save the most money. For my parts today I've selected the quad core FX4300 AM3 Plus CPU from AMD an ASUS M5A97LE board, which is actually pretty feature packed for the £25 it was bought for, a 500GB SATA hard drive, which I'd recommend over an SSD if you want to cut costs a little more. We've also got the 750Ti, which is one of my favourite graphics cards and a real asset to the budget gaming PC world when it was released, as well as 8GB of DDR3 RAM, or what I like to call the sweet spot amount. All of this is powered by a VS450 watt PSU inside a cheap ATX case. Remember to make sure that if your motherboard is ATX form factor like mine, your case supports ATX as well. The first thing we're going to do is assemble our motherboard CPU and RAM combo outside of the case because it's a lot easier this way. Try and doing it inside the case and you'll know exactly what I mean. For the build, I've also opted for an aftermarket cooler because compared to the stock one that comes in the box, it is a significant improvement and you may also need to purchase an aftermarket cooler if you bought a CPU that doesn't come with one on the used market. Before we get to that though, let me talk to you about some issues you may encounter at this point in time. If you bought a used case, remember that you may need to buy the standoffs or these little things separate, which keep the board from touching the case itself, as well as a bag of screws to attach everything. A used motherboard may also not come with a back plate like this example here, which would normally go in the empty hole at the back for the motherboard to sit against inside the case. They're not essential but help keep dust out and can also be purchased separately. Just make sure any listing for a used motherboard says includes IO shield or backplate if you want one of those. So let's put our motherboard CPU and RAM together. With AMD motherboards that usually means lifting this little silver handle up and sitting the CPU just here. There'll be a gold arrow on the CPU which will line up with an arrow on the motherboard so you know it's the right way round. Push the handle back down when you're done. Next we'll install the RAM. This is simple and it just slots into place. If you have four RAM slots and two sticks, put them in slot one and three, or two and four for dual channel or slightly faster performance. If you have one stick of RAM, put it in slot one or two. We then need to apply thermal paste to the processor, which can be bought on Amazon for very little money, but it's essential to stop your processor from overheating. A pea size amount is perfect and you don't need to spread it around because the heat sink will do that once we install it. For our aftermarket one, a bracket goes under the board like so and our heat sink fan combo can then be sat on top. Every aftermarket cooler will come with instructions so follow them for easy installation. This one also uses a thumb screw design so four screws keep it in place. I'll skip this part though as it's a little tedious. Don't forget to plug the CPU cable into the connector labelled CPU fan. Before we install the motherboard in the case though, it's a good idea to remove both side panels for easier access. This will come in handy for cable management should you want to keep things neat for better airflow. Speaking of which, I would recommend purchasing at least a couple of fans, one for the front and one for the back, to pull air in and then extract it out the back of the case to keep overall temperatures down. These fans are already installed from a previous build, but remember that air comes out of the side with this sort of X shape on it, so direct air toward the back of the case when installing fans. The power supply should then go in next because it will give us an idea of how much room we have left to work with. Your PSU may go at the top or the bottom, but installation is the same. Four screws will keep it in place, which I'll skip again here for the interest of time. The motherboard can then go in. Remember that if you have a back plate, install that in the slot below the PSU first and ensure your motherboard standoffs are in place. Most boards, once in, will need six screws to secure. Once that's done, you'll have something that looks a little like this. After that, it's a good time to tackle the front panel cables. Here we have USB, HD audio, as well as a few smaller cables that power the reset and power buttons, as well as the hard drive activity light. 
We'll start off with the USB cable and the slot for that will usually be marked on the board but the holes on the end of the connector are a good indication as to where it goes and the same applies for the HD audio cable. If you have an older motherboard and case, the connector may say AC97 on it instead of HD audio, which is another form of sound. These individual cables are a little more fiddly and won't always be marked out in terms of where they need to be on the motherboard, but consult your motherboard's manual for details. The coloured wire will always connect to the slot labelled plus or positive, whereas the white or sometimes black cable is the ground cable. They should look something like this when connected, but don't worry if you don't get it right first time because you'll do no damage. Just try it again until you get it right. Our hard drive can then be installed. Our slot's in the bottom here and is secured with two screws. You may also need to purchase a SATA cable like this if you bought a used motherboard or don't have a spare one and connect it to both the hard drive at one end and the motherboard at the other. You may also want to install a DVD drive which will require another SATA cable but we're not going to bother here, instead we'll move on to connecting some of these power cables. You probably won't need all of them but the 4 pin connector is a must and is one commonly forgotten by me as well as the 24 pin power connector which can be turned into a 20 pin connector for older balls. Hooking up the 4 pin connector is a good place to start as it can be the hardest to access and some other balls may need an 8 pin connector here if it's a little more powerful. Once that's connected you can hook up the 24 pin cable next to the RAM as well as connecting up the power cable to the SATA hard drive. Case fans will sometimes connect to the PSU as well with a Molex connection like this one. Just connect that up and then we can hook up the rear case fan as well which will almost always plug into a 3 or 4 pin system fan header on the motherboard. Before we install the graphics card, you could then put the side panel back on if you wanted to, which should fit nicely over some of the cables that inevitably get stuffed around the back. More screws hold this in place. It's now time for the graphics card installation. Every case will differ when it comes to how it holds a graphics card in place, and this one has a silly system where you need to unscrew this little hinge thing. Once done though, the GPU can be slotted into the PCI Express 16 slot, and the little hinge can then be screwed back up. Sometimes you'll need to connect a cable from the power supply to your graphics card, but low power ones like this will get all of their power from the motherboard. With that done, it's time to see if it turns on and then jump into a few tests. I wanted to make a separate video about the first things to do with a new PC, so I've already installed Windows 10 here so that I can run a few benchmarks. What is this FX 4300 and 750 Ti combo capable of? Well, first of all, we tested Cinebench R15. We ran the multi-core score test and the single-core score test. With the multi-core result, we scored 321. And with the single re result, we scored just 99. When it came to gaming, GTA 5 ran on the normal textures with high settings to achieve a pretty decent 58 frames per second on average at 1080p and 62 at 720p with better 1% and 0.1% low results. Moving on to Overwatch and we wanted to maximize performance so I ran the game with the low preset and set the FPS to 300. Here we averaged 106 with 1080p and 105 strangely enough with 720p. But moving on to Rise of the Tomb Raider with the medium preset and pure hair off we saw another pretty decent result here. And at 1080p, the game averaged 49 frames per second, but 69 at 720p, with better 1% and 0.1% low results, meaning less stutter throughout our Tomb Raider gameplay. Finally, it was The Witcher 3, which ran best on the low preset with no hair works. We ran the game at 1080p and 720p once again, and I was pretty happy with The Witcher experience here, averaging 41 FPS at 1080p and 41 again at 720p, but improved 1% and 0.1% low results, meaning less stutter throughout. I think the CPU is actually the limitation here, but guys, I hope you've enjoyed this how to build a budget PC video, as well as a few of the quirks that you may encounter when doing so. So as always, thank you for watching, and hopefully I'll see you all soon.